John Garcia, I hope you're having an awesome day, man. Welcome into the game in T-Town. I'm doing well, Ryan. How about you? I'm good, man. Just uh, we're actually uh, down in your your state uh, this week, man. We're live in Destin, Florida, and uh, we were here for SEC spring meetings, but that got canceled about a month ago. But we decided to come to the beach anyway, man. So uh, we're, we're we're supporting the local economy here in Destin. Beautiful, yeah. I mean, all these all these Gulf towns certainly need that moving forward, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of folks agree with with you and I on that, and, and they'll they'll be just fine. They'll be able to rebound, hopefully. Yeah, John, uh, I, we were talking a couple of minutes ago, and, and you've covered Alabama football. Uh, I, I know you're you're on the director of recruiting on the national side of things, but we were just talking a couple of minutes ago, and what is Nick Saban's best team that failed oh, to wow. win a national title, that failed to win a national title? If I ask you that question, what would you say? Wow, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And well, so we, many we had 2013. Because, yeah. We had 2013, because that was a good team. They were trying to do three in a row. 2010 was a great team. 2016 was a great team. And then 2018, when they laid an egg in Santa Clara. Yeah, I'm probably on the 2016 train. I just think, collectively, the, the amount of talent on that roster was, was just, really unbelievable um every single position there was one of those like man i can't believe they didn't really figure it out and and, and the game itself where they didn't win the title we all know you know you know both scarborough goes down and it just everything changes uh, in that game so i i don't know if that's the best team if they went head to head but in terms of the one that maybe should have won a title that didn't i, I think that's the top of my list, you look at the talent on that roster, especially on defense. My goodness, it was like every single position; those guys are, are all millionaires at this point. Uh, so that's the team for me that that I sort of struggle the most with in terms of Alabama not winning a title. I was I was pretty surprised that day down in Tampa. I was I was there I was there with you. Uh, pretty surprised at, at how that one that one played out. Well, and and you know you. Listen, Alabama fans. Alabama fans will be playing the "what if" game for 15 years uh, about that game. But I, I had an analytic guy uh, that does some stuff with uh, Pro Football Focus, and he said, when you look at Alabama, he had already written the article that Alabama defense in 2016 was the greatest collegiate defense, analytically speaking, that had ever been on the football field. He was getting ready to write that article. He said he already had it pre-written. He was ready to publish the article <laughs> if Alabama had won that game. Uh, from a defensive mind, you, you played the game on that side of the field. You think that was one of the best we've ever seen? I do. And, you know, with me, it starts with your ability to rush the passer and play in the secondary. And, and those were two areas where that team was just so strong. I mean, just thinking of the secondary off the top of my head, I mean, how many first-rounders were in that group? And then even beyond the first-rounders, beyond the, the Marlon Humphreys and Minka Fitzpatricks, you had great depth and, and other guys who were really great college players in certain moments. You know, you think of, of guys like, you know, Tony Brown on that team in the secondary. Um, and then up front, I mean, my gosh, every single one of those interior guys went in the first round. Uh, and then on the edge, you had some, some hybrids, right? You had your Rashawn Evans coming off the edge guys like that so um yeah and you the way the way you quantify it when they were in college and and even since then it's really hard to imagine a defense that was was better equipped but but as as we all sort of began to learn uh, around that time you know the 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 spread nature of college football really changed how you view defense you know it's not about yards and points allowed anymore it's about turnovers it's getting off the field on third downs things like that regardless of your talent and and I think that's one of the great examples as to why. So when we get in the, the conversation about pass rush, you, you brought up a, a really good point that we were discussing yesterday with, with one of our analysts. We're talking to John Garcia. He's the director of football recruiting for SI, the Sports Illustrated side, the all-American uh, side of things that they cover. And we're going to give uh, John a couple of seconds here at the end to talk about that. But uh, he talked to – uh, Jim Moore yesterday, and, and, and we're going to dive into that. But, but, but John, you, you talk about putting pressure on the quarterback. You, you, you've got to do it in this current time where these quarterbacks are so elite. If not, they'll pick you apart. 
Absolutely. And then obviously, look, that Clemson team, like nobody, nobody's feeling bad for them that they sort of snuck in there and, and, and got a ring. That, that team was loaded in its own right. And, yeah, you, you know, a hot quarterback. It's like the NCAA tournament, right? You, you run into a hot point guard or shooting guard, a guy who's controlling every possession, and you just can't win, right? Those are the teams that go on these crazy runs and win national titles in college basketball. Well, in football, yeah, that trigger man's obviously the quarterback, and when when he's hot and rolling, you will get you know picked apart. Every every quarterback that comes into college football today is that much more equipped to play immediately because of the year round quarterback training, because of seven on seven, because of the rules and how they've some will say evolved. Guys like me will say changed uh, over the last few years to to really push that. That's what the game wants. That's what safety warrants. I mean, there's so many reasons why. Um, you know, that position is, is so scrutinized and, and really thriving and doing better than ever. So to combat that, yeah, you have to disrupt it with great pass rushing or, and or a great secondary once, once the football is in the air. And Alabama had both of those things working for it for, for most of that game. John, take me to 2020 here, the current class. When you look, because right now I'm trying to find where Alabama is going to get sack numbers from uh, this year. I, it's yeah, I mean, you could talk about, you know, DJ Dale and Christian Barrymore maybe getting pressure from the middle. But, I mean, who is that true pass rusher? Because you lose some pretty good ones from the last couple of years. But, really, uh, the cupboard might be bare unless they're counting on some some younger players. Yeah, there's no doubt. There was a huge emphasis on that in, in the 2020 recruiting class, one of the best in the country. And, really, the centerpiece of that class beyond Bryce Young was that linebacker and edge rushing group that Alabama brought in, there is no doubt that, you know, Will Anderson, Quandarius Robinson, um, guys like that, are Chris Braswell, are going to have to be counted upon uh, to rush the passer, at least from a situational perspective. Um, and if not, I think you see what we've seen Nick Saban do a lot over the years, grab another hybrid linebacker and allow him to be a bit of a pass rush specialist. I think Dylan Moses coming back, has some of that ability. Chris Allen started out as more of an edge guy. He's now got some experience. Christian Harris can do it. Uh, so I think that there's going to be sort of that combination of of young speed edge guy uh, and then those hybrid linebackers who could walk down um, and do it. But it also you know means you got to get a little creative, right? You you have a what we think is going to be a really strong interior with some of those guys that you mentioned. So use that to your advantage. Maybe more stunts, more timely blitzes things like that um, to, to create and, and generate a little bit more pressure. But there's no doubt either way, one of these young pass rushers is, is going to have to step up given what Alabama lost and given what that defensive roster looks like. John, you had a chance to to talk with Jim Moore Jr. about you know this lack of, of area football with limited spring. Uh, I'm curious, what was the biggest takeaway from your interview there with Jim Moore Jr.? Yeah, we, we definitely sat down for quite a while. I think we could have kept that camera rolling for, for hours. Uh, just It's just really cool to sort of talk to someone who's just so in it. You know, and he's literally lived sure. his entire life at, at every level. Um, yeah, the, the interesting takeaways, I, I think, you know, first of all, I'm so curious in how they're going to build up, right? Even if there isn't all clear, you know, how much time really is needed. And, and our guys at SI, Pat Forty, Ross Dellinger, spoke to – every conference commissioner, um, and, and it looks like six weeks is the window. So navigating those six weeks of, of true buildup, a training camp, fall camp, whatever we want to call it, that's going to be so interesting to me because you know there's going to be a portion of your roster that just isn't quite ready for that. So how do you adjust? I think it's going to be so fascinating from a personnel perspective, from an install perspective, and, and even from a health perspective as you try to get these guys up to speed. And then beyond that conversation, some more stuff that we'll be dropping here in the next few weeks with Jim is, is the lack of credibility that we should give to, to some of these early impact guys. We just talked about some of the pass rushers that Alabama needs to bring along. Well, now we've literally gone through an offseason where there's as, as small amount of that as possible to this point. How does that affect all the instant impact players that we thought could come in right away? And that's not just the freshmen. That's grad transfers and kids who, who have gone through the portal, things like that. Think of think of Georgia relying on a guy like like Jamie Newman to to right the ship there at quarterback. You know he is more or less equipped than any transfer quarterback from from any cycle prior. So 
I think maybe relaxing some of those instant impact expectations was was something that that came out of talking to Jim Mora, and, and obviously there's a lot of reason as to why. You can read more about that story, and you can actually watch the video. You can connect with John Garcia. It's at John Garcia underscore Junior. Si dot com is the website. You'll find the All American side of things, and you'll find that conversation. When when you talk, and I don't I don't know if this question was completely brought up. I was able to watch some. But what do you think are the X's and O's impact of, of college football in this limited time, or, or do you think it impacts it at all? You know, I think uh, it's, it's sort of double sword here, uh, double-edged sword, I should say. Uh, on one end, virtually, you are able to, to go over and over and over how many things, you know, you want in, from an installation and X's and O's schematic perspective. But uh, as, as a lot of people will tell you, so much of it is about trial and error on the practice field than it is on the whiteboard. Uh, so there's there's sort of a an interesting dynamic there. You have more sort of looks at the playbook, if you will, with your coach than, than maybe ever before. But on the flip side, you have no physical rep. So I think that gap is, is going to be really interesting to scrutinize this offseason. Um, and whenever we get that green light, I think that's what you're going to see sort of the – be the most important part of this beyond conditioning and health to me is it's getting that foundation that you didn't have the spring to, to work with and you haven't even had in terms of off-season conditioning where you can do maybe some of those things player run player only workouts things like that i mean all of that has been off the table so i think the very fundamentals of the game are, are going to be accelerated once there is some sort of of training camp so maybe the the you know, how exotic an offense or a defense is, is going to be tested right out of the gate. And some of these schools, like in Alabama, have a pretty big game scheduled right out of the gate. So that's going to be really interesting. I think you'll see more of a let them play and, and let the athletes do what they do type of approach on, on both offense and defense, which favors a talented roster like Alabama. But at some point, you're obviously going to have to be able to game plan and install a little bit more physically. So that's, that's going to be fascinating to watch, but there's no doubt that we'll see an impact, especially early in the season. John, take me to Bryce Young. Is, we've, we've had an analyst on earlier today that, that does a great work. He was a former Mississippi State quarterback, Matt Wyatt's a guy that, you know, well-respected in our business and in the industry. And we were talking with, with him, and he, he talked about, that Bryce Young, he feels, has that Tua accuracy, Tua-like accuracy, and he talked about his ability. Uh, what do you see overall in, in Bryce Young from your perspective? There's just a maturity about him that translates to everything you need a quarterback to be, especially if, if he's going to have such a big stage at, at a young age. There is a mental processing about his game on the field, a high risk, a high-reward sort of, of anticipation when he is manipulating the football. He can read defenses as fast as I've seen any high school quarterback. Of course, now he's in college. Uh, and, and then off the field, there's this even-keeled nature about him that I just think makes him built and is such a great fit for a school like Alabama. And, and given his familiarity with Steve Sarkeesian and that scheme, I, I think he's still – in position to challenge Mac Jones uh, about as well as any freshman could with all of those traits. Uh, you, think, you factor in that he's bigger, stronger, and, and still pretty athletic um, from the last time that we saw him, and he's chomping at the bit to get back. And, and I think that even though it's going to probably go into the season, that battle I think is going to rage on for, for quite some time between those two guys. And I think uh, you know if anyone's equipped enough to compete despite all of these you know external circumstances, it would be Bryce Young, Trevor Lawrence. These are the kids that I can think of who could handle something like that coming out of high school from a physical and especially a mental standpoint. So he's, he's really one of the special and, and rare prospects that we've covered at any position. And, of course, this just so happens that you know, now he's, he's at Alabama with you know, where there's a West Coast quarterback legacy that I do envision him sort of holding his own with it. So, so John, do you feel like that, that Bryce Young – could take over at some point? I mean, because we've, we've watched Nick Saban take a quarterback that, that had started for a number of years and, and, and won a lot of football games. He's not afraid to go to that, that route uh, of, of choosing the best quarterback. I mean, could you see Bryce Young w winning in 2020? I mean, we, we know that he is probably the quarterback of the future, 
But, I mean, do you see him finding a way to take over this year? Yeah, you know, it's hard to say. I think with, with an entire spring, remember he was on campus in January, so with an entire true spring and, and an off season, I, I would think that his odds would be pretty strong, near coin flip uh, in my book. I do think despite his, his qualities that the, the likelihood he plays early in a significant role is probably, you know, tainted a little bit. So I think, unfortunately, a lot of it's going to depend on Mac Jones' performance and the team's performance offensively early in the season. You know, if there's a stumbling block, uh, I have no doubt that, that Nick Saban is as liberal as he's ever been with making a change, right? Now there, there's precedent there now, and there's considerable precedence there now. Um, and we know with Nick, that's all it takes for him to truly – buy into that. We've seen him do that with recruiting. We've seen him do that with his schemes, especially on defense, buying into what works now versus what used to work. So I do think that the, the leash would theoretically be shorter on Mac Jones, but I do think the ball will, will most likely be in his court. So unfortunately, if you're an Alabama fan, I think it's going to take a stumble of sorts to get Bryce Young in there because um, I, I really don't see a true sort of two-quarterback system at this point. You know, maybe that changes. Uh, but but I don't see that right now, uh, with given the circumstances and given what how strong Alabama's schedule is early on. If there was a true you know cupcake cupcake, then you get into SEC play maybe. But there's really no time. There's not a lot of time for experimentation in my opinion, given Alabama's schedule and given the circumstances. So I think that certainly uh, slows the the hype with Bryce Young to a degree. John, d- does does that pay off for Nick Saban? in the world of playing the best player, regardless of position, does that pay off with recruit? Because, I mean, there's a lot of recruits feel, hey, listen, man, I, I believe in my talents. Uh, I could go and make an early impact. I mean, decisions like that, I mean, do, do they pay off for Nick Saban? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, he, he's really made it no secret from the beginning that he would play the right guy at the right time, regardless of, of age, experience, and all of these things. Um, so, Look, Bryce Young's going to play. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt about that. You know, how much and, and does he get beyond the four games, things like that. I think those are, are certainly up in the air a little bit, uh, but there's no doubt that, that freshmen can and will play at Alabama if warranted. Um, and I think recruits, rec- I know recruits recognize that on both sides of the ball. I think it's why you're seeing uh, such positive momentum on the recruiting trail right now, especially offensively, those wide receivers. Um, you know, hey, those kids know that this group that, that just went into the NFL and even this group now that's coming back, you know, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, et cetera, all those guys played as freshmen. So you talk about precedent, there's there's a lot of it there at Alabama, even at the quarterback position after after Tua's late rise and, and Jalen Hurts' was freshman season as well. So um, there's really no reservations from a recruit in terms of being able to play early at Alabama outside of the usual depth chart competition, you know, five-star versus five-star connotation that, that comes with that roster. 